Thank you. Pete Cotter. Um, in 2007, the Macular Disease Society not only made that 100,000 contribution, but it was also the largest amount of money that your society had given any one project. And I can definitely say we were in desperate need of that money at the time to continue what has become probably something I never envisaged, which was the London Project to Cure Blindness is now globally known, okay? To the point where um, I travel probably every couple of months to California to what is the California Project to Cure Blindness as well. So it was to try and globalize and try and get a number of scientists together to try once and for all to see whether we could establish a cell therapy for blinding disorders. And the first one which we targeted was age-related macular degeneration. To actually bring you up to date, there's nearly 23, 24 trials since 2007 which have been used to try and treat age-related macular degeneration using a variety of sources. So what was the goal initially? The goal was to try and replace the cells at the back of the eye which are diseased and die. And they're a very specific cell. And the reason we went for age-related macular degeneration is unlike Alzheimer's disease, unlike Parkinson's disease and heart disease, that part of the eye is just one cell, just one cell we had to replace. And equally, to get it into that place would be easier in terms of what its function is. It's not a cell which connects to the brain. It's not what's called a neuron. It's a very simple support cell. So it lies at the very back of the eye, but it is crucial to our health in terms of vision. So what happens as a consequence of age and a consequence of other factors in terms of metabolic stress, as they call it, because there's a lot of things going on at the back of the eye. Vision is a very, very dynamic, very active process. And it's those cells' job to make sure that that whole process is balanced and that they support the seeing part of the eye. But what happens over age, and there are some genetics that we now know, what occurs is those cells begin to stop functioning well and then suddenly start to die. Now, there are two, as you know, processes. One is the wet form and one is the dry form. The wet form is just an earlier indication of the disease as a consequence of vessels, because right at the back of those support cells, there's a layer of blood supply which actually cools those cells. It actually cools the support cells, because they are so active, you have to take a lot of heat away. And that's the job. I mean, it's just like a heat sink. So it takes the heat away from those cells. But during part of the disease, specifically the wet form, that supply of blood puts little vessels through the back of your eye and they're very leaky and that's what causes the wet form. The dry form, you don't tend to see that as much or if at all, but you still eventually get the death of those support cells. So it was my job back in 2007 to see whether we could actually replace those cells. And as part of that project, uh, and with uh, my co-director, a great surgeon at Moorfields, Lyndon de Cruz, what we did, first of all, was actually take some cells from the person's own eye, which were away from the disease, and put them in the area which the cells had died. And that was very successful. And some of those patients now have gone, you know, nearly eight, ten years, and have regained some vision. But the crucial component that I have to say, and it is a difficult one to say, is the time at which we put those cells in. We cannot just put the support cells back and restore vision that's been lost. It's the support cells that have died, but as a consequence, the seeing part of the eye dies as well. If the seeing part of the eye has died as well, 
just putting the support cells back will not restore the seeing part. It just restores the support. So if you've lost some vision, all it will do is slow down, if not halt, the progression of the disease. If you haven't lost the vision, and that's what we did with the patient's own cells, we went in six weeks before there was a sudden massive decline in vision. And that enabled us to bring the vision back because that seeing part hadn't been destroyed. Now, the good news is we are, we have been for a number of years now, been working on that second problem. Can we actually restore the seeing part of the eye as well? And literally until a matter of months ago, um, we were still finding it extremely difficult. But we have had a bit of a breakthrough. So I think even now that may be feasible. How long? I said in 2007 we would go to trial in 2012. And we didn't. So I'm not going to make a prediction. Because <laughs> obviously, apart from obviously beating Wales this evening. Um, but um, I'm not going to make a prediction in that science. So that was our task in 2007. It was to try and put cells back that had died, and specifically those support cells. So what has happened? There has been five trials where people have tried that. One of them was the very person who should have been speaking to you this, this afternoon, which was from uh, Okata. Uh, their previous name was ACT, so Advanced Cell Therapeutics. They changed their name to Okata because they got into a bit of a financial uh, mess, basically, um, and then had to re-establish themselves. Uh, they did two trials. They did a trial in the US and a trial at Moorfields. And the one in the US, they did two clinical populations. They did one for dry age-related macular degeneration in the final stages of that disease. And they also did a Stargardt's group, again, in the late stages of that disease. In more fields, nothing to do with me, okay, don't, don't blame me for it, um, they did a Stargardt's trial at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Now, they have published two papers which suggest that there's some benefit in um, age-related macular degeneration. The general clinical ophthalmology population don't feel the results really do totally agree with their interpretation. What they do agree with is that putting the cells in the back of the eye is safe, but the possibility of it restoring vision is still unclear. And that's because they used late-stage patients. So as I said, if you've already lost your central vision, you wouldn't expect putting an RPE transplant back to save that vision. Only the progression. So it's still unclear with that trial exactly what's happening. They are going to try and do another trial where the vision isn't as bad, so then we would get some information around uh, the efficacy. In terms of the Stargardt, and I don't know whether Andrew is going to mention Stargardt this evening, um, but Stargardt is a different kettle of fish in terms of its disease. So it's not the support cells necessarily at the back which are the problem. It's actually the seeing part of the retina itself which is a problem. And what happens is that seeing part itself starts to die and the consequence of that is toxic to those support cells. So the seeing part dies and those support cells die because they start uh, being affected by the toxic environment. So the rationale necessarily around putting support cells back to stop stargats is a bit concerning, a bit doubtful whether that is exactly the approach you should be using. Because if you put RPE back, they still will be affected by that toxic environment. Now, the two that have reported on the stargats 
Um, they definitely don't show as yet any particular help in terms of vision. Um, they do, however, show that, that proced the procedures themselves are very safe. So the outcome of those trials, which is important, it is important, is that putting cells into the back of somebody's eye when they come from a source which could be potentially dangerous is actually very safe. It's not a problem. So that is very, very important and has helped the rest of us on the way to looking at cell therapies. And then finally, a trial which happened last year was a Japanese group I've actually started a, a process of using a different type of stem cell to actually produce the support cells at the back of the eye. Uh, they treated one patient, have now decided to stop, and I won't go into the reasons for that. So that is the current state of play. I want to change tack for a second, just for a second, and then I'm going to come back to the London project. So that was the state of play at the beginning of the year. One of the things the London Project has decided to do is start a second project. And again, it's much more around, can we restore that seeing part of the retina? But that part of that process is a completely new technology. And it's a new technology that came from different bits of science. And some science that started off at the late 50s. And basically, the dogma in the late 50s was when we grow, so when we form in our mother's womb, and when our heart becomes a heart, eye becomes an eye, brain becomes a brain, at that point, the actual map that got you there, which is in your genes, is lost. So when we're born, the map of how we were born and how we developed is thrown out no longer to be accessed. Well, in the 60s, there was a young graduate student at Oxford, a guy called John Gurdon, Sir John Gurdon now, actually found that was wrong. Your skin cell, your heart cell, your eye cell, every cell still contains that map of how it became what it was. And in fact, he was the grandfather of cloning. If you take that map out and put it into an empty cell, that cell will develop in exactly the same way as that cell developed in the first time. And that was cloning. That was the whole area of cloning. Jump forward now to 2004, and again, a Japanese researcher said, well, if that map and that pathway is in your cell, can we reactivate it? Can we actually start that process again? And unbelievably, and there was many of us who thought, thought he was nuts, actually cracked it. So just by turning on 23 switches, genetic switches in that cell, he took back time. So he took a piece of skin and he turned it right back to a beginning cell, right back to a stem cell. Within six months, he realized he only needed to use 24, uh, four switches, just four switches to do that. Why was that significant? It was significant because now, from a patient, from a piece of skin, we can turn back time, go back to the original cell, and then make the cell that's diseased in that patient. To the point where now we're able to say, what the hell is going wrong in that cell to cause the disease? What drugs can we use to stop that disease? And how can we actually deliver those drugs? It's a new era for regenerative medicine. How can we actually do it? We can take you as your own example and in a dish grow your disease and then use as many drugs as we think possible to potentially slow or try and stop it. So what has happened through, again, a very generous donation by the Brian Mercer Foundation is the London Project has set up a bank of disease lines. So diseases which result in retinitis pigmentosa, 
diseases that result in uh, macular disease. We have somewhere in the region of about 20 different diseases in the fridge. Three of them have already come up with new treatments for what was considered untreatable. Okay. But it was from donations from your cells that made that whole thing feasible. Okay. And actually, two guys, John Gurdon, who I mentioned, and Shinea Yamanaka, received a Nobel Prize in 2012 for that whole finding, and rightly so. It's changed the whole way in which we can try and discover what is happening during disease. So that came from a philanthropic donation. So what brings me here today? What brings me here today is eye disease accounts for nearly 20% of the burden in terms of healthcare, as the NHS terms it. Yet we only get less than 2% of the research money. We are totally, totally dependent on your donations in terms of ophthalmology and exceedingly grateful for those donations, support, and actual voices in terms of trying to push forward these organizations in government to make sure that we do get funding going in the right way.